Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of The Agronomists. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, um, and we are, we're having a great time already tonight. So uh, thanks to everyone who's already joined us, who said hello. Uh, Scott managed to get the welcome in tonight, so we'll see if John shows up today or not. But I do appreciate the regular crew joining us. Uh, it's going to be a good one. Uh, tonight, we're talking about Plan B, C, D, Tillage zapping i don't know uh for herbicides for weed control it's going to be potentially a very interesting year but before i bring in our guests i do of course want to go through a few things for tonight as always please uh, ask your questions comment often that's what makes this show so much fun and uh for watching you do qualify for ceu credits so head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists uh tomorrow morning and make sure you let us know uh, that you watch so you can claim those credits and of course we do have show sponsors so big thank you to Adama Canada to Real Ag Radio and to Mind Your Farm Business Adama Canada while other sources of innovation run dry Adama is here to deliver leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges we are all in on you talk to your Adama sales rep today um, and yes of course Real Ag Radio Monday to Friday uh, on Real Radio Channel 147 um, and uh, it, it was a good show today if anybody caught it it goes at 4 30 but you can of course listen to it on realagriculture.com or on Spotify after it goes live and uh, Peter Johnson who I see is in the chat was on today's show and actually uh, talked about this as uh, this topic a little bit as was um, one of our guests which I will bring in now. So Jason Vogt at a field to field agronomy from near Carmen, Manitoba and Ryan Benjamins of Benjamins agronomy out of Lambton County, the beautiful Lambton County. All right. I have been there once. We were talking about this before the show started. Um, but you know what? It was, it was lovely. So hats off to Lambton. Um, and hi to Sarah, if you're watching. It's, it's, I know like three people from that area. Anyway, okay, so we are tonight. Um, nobody cares about me. It's all about herbicide. All right. It's about plan B, C, and D because plan A, A may not work. B might not be an option. Um, C, we'll see. Okay, so Jason, let's uh, let's start with you. Let's start with sort of the lay of the land right now. How are you feeling as far as particular herbicide volumes go for um, access this spring? How are you feeling? Actually, you know what? <clears throat> Talking to a few of my growers lately and some other uh, agronomist friends, pretty good at this point. And I think the reason is um, when you talk to most of them, a lot of product has been taken home already. So when it comes to the, uh, you know, what are the big players in question? Well, it's glyphosate, glufosinate, anything with MCPA, those type of things. And for the most part, guys have been able to source enough and brought it home on farm already last fall or during the season. The only issue last fall was when guys brought a lot of their glyphosate home at a better price. We ran into the, all that regrowth. And so some of that supply was spent on in the fall already too. So they're probably having to look for a little bit more supply, but for the most part, it's okay. But there still is a percentage of guys that are going to be the ones that are just like, well, we'll wait and see and deal with it when we get there. Okay. Ryan, how about you in your neck of the woods? What are, what's the rumor mill say? <laughs> well, yes, some of it is rumor, but yeah, some we've realized even last year already that it is, it is true. It's a real concern. There are tight products. Um, glyphosate, as Jason mentioned, that, that was the biggest one last year uh, that carried on into the fall and it's going to continue this year. There's more announcements almost every month that, you know, mm. shipments will be lower than expected to the retail level. Um, like Jason, there's surprisingly, I would say a record amount of glyphosate already on the farm, um, which is a good thing. So, but it, it, we don't have hundred percent coverage out there. Uh, there's still more that needs to get shipped. Um, MCPA products were a little bit of a issue last year. Uh, we also had more wheat acres last year, this year. Yeah, there's a decent wheat crop out there, but it's smaller than last year. So, 
Um, I'm not too concerned about about uh, wheat herbicide supply. Um, I would say I I did get an email from a retailer that a, quite a few of my customers deal with uh, last week's kind of outlining products that were sold out at the manufacturer level, and I was surprised how large that list was. Um, but I think okay. it's there's a lot of products that are allocated. Um, there's probably, you know, a lot coming down that supply chain now. Um, I think that we're, we're not in deep trouble. Um, it's just going to take a lot of planning uh, and coming up with option B, C, D <laughs> as mm -hmm. needed yeah, and, and being a little bit flexible. So. Yep. Yes. Okay. So that is, that's where I'm going to go to start off with perfect segue, Ryan. It's like we planned this, um, but we didn't. I'll have everybody know. Uh, but in the chat, anyone who's watching, whatever platform you're on, um, let me know either which product you're most nervous about being able to ac access or which crop you're most worried about having good options for. Um, because we're going to break it down, I think, sort of those two ways, right? So we've covered off a bit of what we've heard rumbling wise. And of course, we've had some of that confirmed, right? And and Ryan, as you said as well. Um, so just late last week, uh, Trish Jordan of Bayer was on, on the radio show. She She's saying that at least for like pre-seed burnoff into June, glyphosate supplies, at least from Bayer's perspective, should be fine. Now, past June, she didn't necessarily comment. And what that means by geography or where you're from, um, I mean, there's still so many other steps in the chain. But as a major producer, of course, of glyphosate and for and for other companies, um, you know, it's going to be tight, but it should be there. And as you mentioned, there's quite a bit on farm. So it's still, though, I think going to be a concern for sure. But I think just in general, the supply chains of so many things have been interrupted in the last year to two years um, that, you know, why wouldn't we necessarily be somewhat concerned about some of these other ones? So I guess I'll put that question to you while we wait for maybe some people to chime in on the chat. Uh, Jason, is there a particular crop that you're perhaps most worried about options or plan B and C for? Yeah, and I would say probably the first ones that come to mind are going to be um, corn, soybeans, and canola. And mm -hmm. predominantly when we talk about canola, it's going to be the uh, liberty tolerance or glufosinate tolerant canolas. So, I mean, <laughs> liberty itself through BASF is produced in Regina. Um, we're getting an indication for them that, yeah, they're, they've got the supply they need for the acres of seed that they've booked. And then we have other sources for generic glufosinates as well. So, I mean, it, that's still, though, something that's a little bit of a concern for me because what happens then is if a grower is you know, needing more than one pass of glufosinate and he's been using Liberty, let's say, at the first pass and doesn't have enough to do the second, what is he going to choose as far as a generic? And they don't all mix together well physically. Mm. So, for example, Interline from UPL does not mix well with Liberty. And so those are some things that I'm concerned about with growers that if they run short and they need to top up with something else, they need to be very aware of, you know, the active ingredient amounts, but also whether or not they tank mix, those kind of things. So, um, and when it comes back to corn and soybeans, then yeah. Uh, there's that slide that I sent Jay when it talks about all the different corn herbicides that are registered in Manitoba. So other than glyphosate, we do have a number. And Jay, if you want to pull that one up, you can. Now, this is probably not a complete list, obviously, for the for the uh, the guys in the audience or the people that are in the audience that are real critical. You know, they're going to probably. Um, I'm sure <laughs> someone trouble. will point out one that you've missed but that's okay yeah exactly so i We're likely have missed Heather. one because i am old you know that kind of thing so <laughs> but this is just a kind of a, a list of the uh herbicides that are registered in manitoba looking at pre-plant incorporated pre-emerge early post late post so you do see that we do have a number of options other than glyphosate that we can use and i was talking to a good friend of mine david chapela who is the provincial agronomist for thunder seeds he also farms, has a family farm as well, and talks to retails and growers on a regular basis. 
And I asked them about, you know, how many growers are generally using a pre-emerge system in their corn and soybeans? And he figured about 50%. And I think that might even be high. So there's definitely opportunity there for guys to look at, you know, the timing of a product, like for pre-emerge, taking advantage of some of these other products if glyphosate is short or not available. And when it comes to things like, you know, it comes to soybeans, we don't have a lot of other options in crop. And the bulk of them are group two, which we already are, you know, probably putting too much pressure on when it comes to resistance. Absolutely. All right, Ryan, I mean, that's, um, is it a similar list for you as far as corn and soy? Are you more worried about soy? And I want to ask, there's an interesting stat about the pre-emerge on corn. So I want to ask what you figure the number is here in Ontario. Maybe uh, I see Pete's in the chat. He might too. He might as well. But Ryan, which one are you maybe most worried about? Yeah, I'm I'm generally more concerned about soybeans than I am corn. Uh, we have a lot of options in corn, both pre-emerge or early post-emergent, where we can use something other than glyphosate that will take out uh, small weeds. Um, it might be a bit of a tank mix, but not, uh, uh, not too complicated, especially if we can still keep a low rate of glyphosate in the tank. Um, like even on Jason's chart there, there's a product, uh, Halex GT, a program like that, um, that's got your Callisto and your dual, um, added to it. Um, I'm, I am definitely more concerned about soybeans. Um, we have, we don't have, well, there's a decent uh, IP market in Ontario, um, but if we all of a sudden moved all of our Roundup or glyphosate tolerant acres to start using conventional herbicides, we would run out just like overnight. Um, mm. Those yeah. sort of products in conventional herbicides are usually every year kind of forecasted what they were the year before, and there's not this huge extra supply. Um, there's even things, small details, but important ones like surfactants. Um, this coming year, we will not have turbocharge anymore. And someone might think, well, that's no big deal, right? It's just a surfactant. Um, but the replacements, equal replacements is like Surmix. So that could quickly sell out. Uh, trying to find an equivalent surfactant like um, Carrier from New Farm. All the all the replacements of turbocharge will once once an announcement comes out that there's going to be no more turbocharge, the replacements just funnel down, being yeah. more or less sold out rather quickly. So. Mm -hmm. So, so so on that and and so and we've certainly seen in these last two years how you know waiting for one thing like a surfactant or an adjuvant or whatever like a chip for our vehicle can suddenly, you know, blow up an entire uh, supply chain, right? So we we know that this can happen. Now in the comments, and I know this is a conversation that's happening, is perhaps the saving grace here is that it does seem like IP acres are going to be down, if only because conventional or, I mean, yes, conventional soys, I guess, um, are, the price is so good, is it really worth, you know, pushing for that IP premium is the premium really there um, it's a conversation I suppose but I mean as you mentioned and this is actually something that you know uh, Pete has brought up a couple times as well is that you know perhaps we've secured you know most of the supply of something but then the alternative products have sort of a traditional demand curve and if we suddenly shift a lot of demand for some of these other products um, or to a different time of year, do we sort of induce a bit of a supply crunch, even though maybe there isn't one there? So um, it, it does beg the question, you know, how long are some of these supply chains, how short, um, and where acres end up? Now, I know I did see last week um, the AgriCore numbers here in Ontario, and anyone who loves wheat, cover your ears, but I think insured acres were 600, under 620,000. Um, and that's insured in the fall. So some of those are not going to make it. Um, yes, some could be insured this spring, but some are also not going to make it. So we are looking at a pretty small wheat crop, but that means something else is going in, which is probably beans. And so you're exactly right. If glyphosate does run short and we have to go to some of these other ones, um, Ryan, then then where do we go? Um, 
Okay, so I, I want to actually on that topic because I think we need to talk more about soybeans. I am going to go to a clip. I know everyone. You're welcome. Um, but we're going to go to to Mike Cobra, our OMAFA, our weed specialist here in the province. And uh, it's just a short clip looking at uh, the efficacy of that pre-emerge and then that in-crop pass in IP beans. And it brings up a couple, I think, uh, a couple things we need to talk about. So, Jay, if we can go to Mike Cobra in the field. Every year... Uh, there's always at least two or three questions around what's the best herbicide program to use in IP soybeans or food grade non-GMO soybeans. And I'm sorry to tell you there is not one magical herbicide that is always going to amazingly work awesome. But what I can tell you is there's some general principles that put us in the end of having good weed control every year versus not having good weed control. And so I'm here at the Allure Research Station where we have one of our uh, comparative trials where we look at 16 different herbicides and non-GMO soybeans. And here's a year where uh, things look pretty amazing. So you can he see here behind me is the plot. This is a herbicide treatment. About uh, six feet is sprayed and you can see to the left there uh, the massive weed pressure that, that's there. So this is a soil applied herbicide. So that's kind of rule number one of IP soybeans is always put down a soil applied herbicide. Uh, this is the soybean school. So we should remember that the most important part about weed competition and yield loss is weeds that come up uh, before or with the crop are the most impactful for yield. So if we lay down a soil applied herbicide, we can eliminate that early season competition. But you might say, well, if I don't get rain, that soil applied herbicide looks like crap. Uh, yes, uh, in our trials over the last 10 years, about six years out of 10, that soil applied herbicide does fail and we need to go back in and do something else. You're looking here at the 40% of the time where the soil applied herbicide gets moisture for activation and it looks beautiful and it looks beautiful throughout the season. But more often than not, what happens is uh, we should be out there scouting about three weeks after the application of the soil applied herbicide. That's when we start to see that second flush of weeds or escapes. And then we can hit that with a post-emergent herbicide. And when we do that, the combination of both pre and post-emergent herbicides, we end up having great weed control. We minimize yield loss from weed competition. And we most importantly, get our IP premium. So a soil applied herbicide applied before the crop emerges in IP soybeans is an absolute must. But as I mentioned before, about 60% uh, of the time, it doesn't provide season long control. There's later escapes and we need to address that with a post-emergent herbicide. And you can see, here's an example where after three weeks, I did see the odd witchgrass coming up here. There's a couple of lambs quarters in there. Uh, I chose not to come back in right for the purposes of experimentation uh, now we're in you know mid-august and we're already starting to see those weeds coming above the canopy and come harvest time it'll be a little bit dirty so that's why we say come back with a post-emergent herbicide and be scouting three weeks after uh, that soil applied herbicide has been applied and then we'll have uh, optimized weed control in non-gmo ip soybeans I forgot to mention it's February 28th, which means tomorrow is March, which means we're mm -hmm. that much closer to green fields um, that Mike is standing in. Anyway, I just like February. And so tomorrow I can smile. Um, okay, so great comments coming through. And uh, I chose that clip because, of course, if we are very short of glyphosate, which we may not be, um, we end up with potentially having to treat our conventional soys a lot like IP beans, which, yes, is probably going to cost uh, more money. Now, Patrick brings up a great point. So should I be spending my money on tillage instead of herbicide? Because his organic friends don't seem to complain about shortages. Um, Ryan, what do you think? Can tillage replace herbicides in any reasonable amount? So... Tillage is one of the tools that we can use. Uh, it is not a suitable replacement to take it out of the system altogether. Uh, you're still stuck with cleaning up like in crop maybe. If, and that's if you do a, a fine job at the, we'll call it the burn down with tillage. Um, 
the whole shortage with glyphosate makes people realize actually how good of a herbicide glyphosate still is today. I mean, we have four glyphosate mm -hmm. resistant weeds in Ontario. And even with four glyphosate resistant weeds, we still realize how good glyphosate is. We can spray it in all kinds of weather conditions. I mean, not below freezing, but uh, it, it just works so well at, over such a broad array of different weed species. Um, it's, you know, it works well on perennials, annuals, grasses, broadleaves. It's, it's a really, really good herbicide. So I would say to Patrick, uh, I would still go buy glyphosate because today you still can. Um, but we as an industry and as producers have to ask ourselves, where can I maybe shave glyphosate, right? And how am I going to do that in all systems, in corn, in, in soybeans, pre-emerge, post-emerge? How am I going to reduce my rate per acre while still being on label and doing a fine job on weed mm -hmm. control. So yeah. I'm sure we'll get into that tonight, but I have some strategies as to how to do that in both corn and soybeans to yeah. limit yeah. Our, our glyphosate usage. Yeah. Now, Jason, we also have, uh, so we are talking soybeans, but edible beans has come up as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to guess you've got some clients that grow edible beans. Yep. Are you at all concerned about what this year might look like? Um, yes, in a little, uh, in some respects, just because again, I mean, we do try to use as much of a burn down as we can before edible beans. Now, a lot of guys are using a pre or a pre plant type of product like uh, Edge or, or Treflin as well, and there are different options there too. So, one of the things I was thinking about when when we were discussing this plan B, C or D is um, old herbicides are becoming new again, or I shouldn't maybe say old. I was told by John Hurd not to say old, but to say proven herbicides. Oh, oh I know. like that. Yeah. So things like Eptam, you know, things like that, that are coming back, you know, to be used in, in um, to try to manage certain weeds, but also, you know, to help with resistance and therefore also helping with supply as well. Now we're also dealing with a lot like, um, like Ryan was saying, we have a lot of more group two resistant weeds, pigweed, kochia uh, happening with, so that becomes really, really challenging for dry beans. So that, that pre-emerge part is even more crucial when we look at dry beans. Mm -hmm. Um. So I, whenever you think it, proven, I like that. I always think Avidex. Um, <laughs> yeah. Always. Right? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay. Um, Ryan, let's, let's talk about some of those strategies though, because this is one of the things I do want to dig into tonight. Um, and I did, I lamented before we went on air that I didn't grab a clip of the weed zapper. Cause I was like, Hey, let's just, you know, throw herbicides out the window and find all the other ways we can attack weeds. But no, this is about, yes, all the tools in the toolbox, but even within that tool of herbicides, what are all the different things that we can use? But how do we put this all together? So Ryan, maybe walk us through some of what you're, you're sort of going through over corn and soy for strategies for this year, for sure. Okay. Yep. So in I guess both in corn and soybeans, I think of two things. One is weed species and the other one would be weed size. So as we get larger weeds, we got to use more glyphosate. Um, so it we have to spray when weeds are smaller. Uh, and we can also reduce weed size and weed pressure by using residual, a good solid foundation residual program. Um, the other one is weed species. So that involves a little bit of knowing what historical weeds have been a challenge for you on your farm and doing some research using documents like publication 75 um, or the pest manager app that Mike Cobra has developed. You can plunk in things like thistles. So you plunk in Canada thistle, sow thistle. It'll quickly show you lawn trowel plus uh, 360 grams of glyphosate um, is about the same control, maybe even slightly better than a 2x rate of glyphosate is on Canada and South Thistle. Um, some other weeds that 
usually we have to increase our glyphosate rate for would be things like nutsedge. So maybe it means we add a, a group two like permit to our glyphosate, a low 360 gram rate of, of glyphosate that way. And then I think of the large broadleafs. Once you get lambs quarters, ragweed, um, pigweed, taller than a few inches, then, then we start need to look at whether it be a group 27 herbicide. I think of yeah. Callisto and atrazine or Armazon atrazine. Or uh, if we can do so, uh, another group four. I mentioned Lontrell already as a group four, but to come to mind would be our distincts, marksmen, uh, or lower volatile dicambas like Ingenia, Extendamax, those, those products. So um, that's kind of the corn strategy is, is knowing what weeds you have and, and targeting them. Mm -hmm. And keeping them small. I like that. Also, one of my favorite things about Nutsedge is the nutlets that it makes. Anyway, <laughs> um, just putting it out there. Uh, yeah, Pete did remind me. Ryan, do you have a guess or an estimation of pre-merge on corn? Um, I would say it's, I would say it's about 50%, but then probably another close to another 50% get, I would say a residual product early post emerge. So okay. we're pretty well hundred percent of our corn acres see more than just glyphosate. We're, we're pretty right. well near a hundred percent. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, there is one question here about pulses, which I, I, I mean, I suppose edible beans sort of fit in there. Uh, I think it was Scott that asked it. Um, right. With thinking about herbicide carryover, dry conditions, but what do we think of pulse on pulse due to residue concerns or trying to cut nitrogen needs? Now we've brought in the other limiting factor, nitrogen. We're going to try and focus on herbic herbicides, but of course we can't have any crop production discussion without bringing nitrogen into it. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we're talking, and this is a quick shout out, next week we're going to talk about um, switching out crops and switching out varieties if things get short there too. But Ooh. Jason, any thoughts? Pulse on pulse. Mm -hmm. So it's a good, how uh, can I say it? It's not something that you would consider being a, a long-term strategy, but definitely short-term, let's say for the this particular year, it, it's okay. Like in our situation, uh, we we had significant drought in the large part of our area in south central Manitoba, and so I have soil test results ranging from 120 to even 200 pounds of residual nitrogen. And in a normal case, um, the crop rotation was supposed to go to soybeans in that case, and a guy is like, "Well, okay, maybe I should do soys on soys instead." And put something else on that field that's going to actually use that nitrogen and that's okay you know in that particular case you know for for this one year it's not going to be a problem and it's probably the better way to use utilize that nitrogen especially when we have such high uh, fertilizer costs mm -hmm. now ryan i'm going to guess that no one none of your clients grow soybeans on soybeans but let's say if someone did um, are there any are there any savings there? Are there any added added costs if we're talking about the herbicide side of things? Um, yeah, I would say there's there's certainly not any savings. Uh, we're looking at a yield reduction, planned yield reduction. Um, I would say especially if we grew identity preserved soybeans two years back to back any weed escape in the first year is going to be that much of a greater challenge in the second year. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. possibly more, more expense to growing beans on beans. Yeah. There might be that issue of uh, if you're in a wetter climate, like you might have in Ontario versus Manitoba, where maybe sea treatment might be a, of a, more of a cost just because of disease when you're going back to back. I didn't mention that here because we were so dry I don't think it would be a problem, but <laughs> of all our growers that would normally do it, I don't have too many that are actually going back to back soys on soys. They, because they've had so many years of history of soybeans, they're willing to put soybeans on ground that has 150 pounds or more of nitrogen. 
if it if it makes sense to stay with that rotation. Wow. Um, I see Peter is saying that there's 33 years continuous soys in Lambton County. That That is not a distinction that we need to share. <laughs> okay. Yeah, does, um, does Pete want a prize for that or something? <laughs> no, it's <laughs> not his field. I promise you it's not his field. Um, anyway, I don't understand it. Corn on corn, I think we can have that discussion. Uh, Warren Schneckenberger says Farmer Schneck says strip till corn and no till soybeans are making cutting glyphosate a challenge so let's maybe that's a really good point let's talk a bit about bringing in that discussion of tillage strip tillage so your your system your cropping system how that factors into as you mentioned ryan a really using a really effective herbicide like glyphosate how it makes that possible so so ryan maybe i'll start with you um how does strip till make this potentially a, a more difficult thing to, to stick handle? Um, yeah, because you're more or less, you have to treat that field as, as a burn down application. Um, again, it comes down to how, what I mentioned earlier, just knowing what weeds are there and what to target. Um, it's amazing what, you know, even any, really any product, the group fours, I think, especially, uh, they can bring some some extra benefit to the burn down that we don't necessarily need to have a, a real high glyphosate rate. Um, doing those burn downs earlier in the spring before weeds get too big. Even I, I mentioned some group fours, group twos, some group 27s. I even think of a group 14 like integrity in corn. Uh, that can do a pretty fine job burning back a lot of annual broadleaf weeds like lamb's quarters, ragweed that are there in, in strip till. So we, mm -hmm. we certainly have options. Um, no till. Do you, do you want to talk about soybeans? Sure. Yeah. We can talk okay. about whatever we want. The yeah, world so is our in, in soybeans, again, we've got the group fours in whether that be enlist or if we're growing round to pretty two extends, then we, we've got our dicamba products those help keep our glyphosate rate in check um and then we can use some as jason mentioned proven products the old uh i think of chlor chloramineron ethyl like the classics uh chaperone mm -hmm. is a generic classic those help with dandelion for years we've used that as a as a strong dandelion tool so no-till soybeans um that there's a strong fit for that that group too. Um, and then in identity preserve soybeans, or I should back up any, any herbicide where we're adding a residual that contains metribuzin, uh, that clay based product can tie up glyphosate. So it, it might mean a two pass burn down and laying mm -hmm. the residual down separate from the, from the glyphosate is another mm -hmm. way that we can reduce glyphosate usage. Okay. Yeah. And Jason, I mean, you mentioned that as well as knowing which products play nice together in the tank Yes. and which exactly. ones do not. Yeah. So there is even, yeah. there's even certain glyphosate products that don't mix well together too, depending on what salt they are. So those are some things we have to keep aware of too, maybe more this year than other years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Doug, Doug McComb has a good question here. Will Enlist change herbicide stocks? So you did mention this, Ryan, um, as well. So do we see Enlist sort of shifting some of the demand uh, between some of these products? Yeah, we're we're situated quite nicely on, on Enlist products themselves. If I think of Enlist 1 or Enlist Duo. I think that is not really a product of concern at this point. I know 2,4-D ester particularly is, but in terms of once you jump to enlist, I don't believe that's really a product of concern at this point. Um, I would warn probably the one of the holes with the enlist system is still fleabane control, so Roundup resistant mm -hmm. fleabane, and not relying just on 2,4-D choline to give us our our flea bane control. So we, we may, in terms of uh, what it does for other products, we have to rely, uh, you know, the Aragons, um, 
Metribuzin products, adding something to to the Enlist system. Um, but I don't see either of those products really running short. So it is a suitable option to, to yeah. use the Enlist system. Now, Jason, let's jump back a, a bit to the strip till system. I think you've uh, we've got a we've got a photo, I think, as well. But what's your yeah. experience in in Manitoba there in working so, the strip till system into the production cycle? Right. So we're still, I would say, on the newer side of things. Now there are some growers um, like Dean Taves up by uh, a bag at there. He's he's been in it for a number of years already, but showing this the, this uh, particular field scenario here what i'm hoping to gain out of this is that maybe with having a situation like strip till maybe we can suppress some of these weeds inter row and just you know be able to focus on you know the row, treating the row itself now we're probably still going to have to treat the the entire field but if we can get some suppression especially from in this particular case the residue that you see there is uh fall seeded oats but if we're doing fall seeded like fall rye there's a lot of information coming out of ndsu where we're seeing quite a bit of suppression of weeds coming from a product from a species like fall rye just because of the allelopathic effect that it has on um, germinating weeds so if we can combine that maybe we can reduce some of the applications that we have in crop and maybe focus on just what's in that uh, that strip itself so you know, stay tuned because we are still on the, the early side of it. And then the, Jay threw up this slide here. So this is an example of fall rye here as well. And what I wanted to point out here was, and uh, Ryan mentioned it before when that question came up about um, tillage. Um, as far as I know, there isn't any weeds resistant to iron. So... When we think about tillage, it can be our friend when it comes to certain situations. It's a cultural control, just like what you're seeing here, where we're dealing with fall rye. You can see how close that canopy is to closing. So row spacing, um, crop competition from you know population, those are things that we need to look at uh, more closely as well if we're going to run into issues with certain product supply. You know, we need to look at these other things to help compete with weeds, you know, utilizing these cultural practices. Jay, can you go back to the strip tillage one? I just, Peter mentioned it, but I would also like everyone to just go, that's some nice soil. I just, oh, yeah. I'm just, oh. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, and no, yeah. Warren, there are, there are no rocks, not in this part of the world. Um, no. no one, no one has to pick rocks there, but so, but this <laughs> is, so there were some comments that did ask about cover crops as well and how that works into mm -hmm. it. And this is, this is part of that conversation. And of course, out West, yes, moisture is limiting. So um, not just season length, but, but moisture, especially last year. But it still bears mentioning, and so I'm I'm really glad we have this. That um, one of the and one of the comments I think that you know that came up just two weeks ago here on the Agronomist was just how good a job a fall cover crop does in in suppressing weeds. So that was that obviously would have to have been done last year, or if you've been in a rotation of doing it for a couple of years, you'd be reaping those benefits this coming year when we control might. You know, you might not have your favorites or you might have to shift things. But um, but looking at exactly that, you know, there is the mention we've been talking about, you know, in no-till systems um, that the the dandelions getting huge and those sorts of things. I'd love to see if we're looking at, um, you know, what can we do about dandelion? Can we keep them smaller? Can we choke them out a little with, with cover crops, let's say, um, or keep them at bay from getting too bad? potentially um because that is definitely some of these are those bigger problems that they they're just i mean they're persistent problems for a reason but um mm -hmm. i just i really do miss this soil i'll be honest we don't have anything this pretty where i'm at anymore jason um anyway so yes yeah, so thanks jay for going back to that i do appreciate it yeah what can you say it also floods every couple of years so you know you gotta take <laughs> one with the other whatever <laughs> um but there's no rocks um so yeah so that is it's it's one of the things that um and maybe we can talk a little bit more about it um but so you know for sure we need to be thinking about um what our other options are and actually 
Pete had a really good point and Ryan, you did as well, about the pest manager app. And so that's one of the things as we begin winding down here tonight is I want to talk a bit about strategy, but a bit of sort of advice for we're now, well, tomorrow's March one, you know, within 60 days, everything's going to be rocking and rolling here. Right. So what, so let's talk maybe about in this next window of time, what we can be doing to set ourselves up in the best case scenario heading into the field. Who wants to start? I know it's a little vague. <laughs> Jason, maybe. Yeah, okay, yeah. there you go. Okay, good. Yeah, so we, we need to have a plan in place, right? We need to know what, come up with a, a list of products and volumes, and we need to start talking to our retail uh, and find out do that you have supply of these products if you do can i take delivery of them already uh i would say last year was the first year that a number of my clients realized hmm i can't really call the day before i need something and expect to get it just like that anymore right we're mm -hmm. living in different times and so it's not only good for the retailer but it's good and reduces stress for the producers themselves uh mm -hmm. if they have a plan in place they can follow that plan and if we need to change the plan so be it we we right now we have other tools to use and let's find out what those tools are so absolutely all right so i do want to point out and i've done this before but i'll be the safety officer with my little sign make sure that you're storing it properly whatever you take delivery of whether it's fertilizer or fuel or herbicides or inoculant, make sure you're equipped to actually store it properly, safely and properly, please. Um, mm -hmm. We've got lots of comments coming in, so that's really, um, but some of them have to do with my sheep sinking in that mud. So yes, actually that kind of soil, everyone, is the kind where you get taller as you walk across it because when it's wet, it sticks to your boots and then it just keeps growing. So you just get taller as you walk across. Anyway, okay. So so yeah. So take talk to your retail early. Take delivery if you can. Store it safely. Jason, what would you add? Um. Then looking at those alternatives. So if you can't get product A, and get it home, what would be the next thing to look at? And so when we talk about our small or cool season crops, like our cereals, there are definitely a lot more options. But then I would look at those kind of things. And then back to what Ryan said, it has to be based on what weed spectrum you have, right? And trying to keep uh, resistance in mind. And one of the things we want to make sure we educate growers on going into this year is that even if you have, a, have uh, access to a certain product, but not sure you can get enough of it, this is not a strategy of um, cutting rates to try to extend that product out. We do not want to do that. So we want to make sure that full application rate, registered rate gets on because we don't want to promote any more resistance than we don't already have by doing that. So then that's where we look at, okay, well, is there anything else we can do to help the performance of this product? So Ryan mentioned products earlier on like turbocharge. You know, we've been looking a lot more at um, MSOs um, water, uh, deposit, deposition agents, things like that, you know, to try to help. It's not going to make the product better, but it's going to do a lot better at maybe getting it to the canopy, depending on that certain situation. And that's, I brought that up shamelessly because I have that photo <laughs> to show you of that comparison on uh, volunteer canola so, control. So so strategic, Jason. Yes, yeah. Jason, you bring up yeah, the in, I think it's a it's interlock, I think, right? Yeah. So there's um, a we'll see. So there's a, a grower that I know, uh, John Bergen from go. McKnight Farms. Uh, yeah, so John Bergen out of McKnight Farms in Roland, Manitoba had uh uh posted this picture. It was a few years ago already. So what he what he had done is he had done uh he was going with reflex um in crop on soybeans to control volunteer canola and this is not to try to diss li 700 it has its purpose it's uh, it probably did what it was supposed to do as far as a ph adjuster but what the grower was looking for here was well we're windy all the time we have limited spray days 
what can I do to get this contact product down, you know, to with less drift to get more coverage on that, that weed. And when you look at the size of that canola, that was the other issue too. This is, you know, volunteer canola in soybeans that was quite large. And you can see the difference between using a deposition drift reducing agent versus something like a pH adjuster. So those kind of things is what I'm talking about as far as enhancements or products. They're not, they're just, they're basic. They're basically you look at adding them to that specific situation of what you want to accomplish with it. But the idea then is trying to get the most out of that herbicide so that hopefully if we're doing a better job, maybe we don't have to go back in a second, third or fourth time. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add and anytime, well, we could talk about the critical weed free period, but there's also a point where you revenge spring, right? So, right. Do we don't have to have perfectly pristine fields? Like at some point, the weeds are not taking anything from yield. Yes, they're there, but they're not taking any more yields. So sometimes you're just going to have to let them be there. Now, yep. yes, we have certain weeds that we don't want to return to the weed seed bank. We know that there's there's some of those, but yeah, perfectly clean is is not. Yes, I do love the term revenge spring. I don't love the practice. Um, okay, <laughs> some good questions coming in. How much um, is? I mean, do we think that there's a bit of hoarding happening of product, or would you say most are just keeping on farm what they think they're going to need and does that induce a bit of panic does talking about it make it happen i guess is the is the one is the way to put it i can answer first jason looks like you're thinking so oh um i mentioned at the beginning that there's probably record amount of glyphosate on farm today than i've ever seen before I wouldn't really go to say it's hoarding. I don't believe that people are holding on to more than what they need uh, to get them through this season. I don't even, most of my producers don't even have glyphosate on farm to cover for their fall need, uh, burn downs in the fall, terminating cover crops, that sort of stuff is not on farm. People have on farm what they need to get our spring burn downs done and our maybe our in crop cleanup. In terms so. of other products, it's very hard to hoard. I think shelves were more or less empty in the fall, but uh, manufacturers don't really have this huge supply of other residual based herbicides sitting there uh, Mm -hmm. more than a year out. So uh, as much as somebody maybe wanted to prepay, they couldn't necessarily hoard and take home uh, what they needed. So and that would speak to a lot of things like fungicides and and all that stuff it no there's not really on farm or much on farm yet to that degree exactly 100 percent. i agree with uh, ryan there uh, as well their guys aren't hoarding when it comes to the uh, their own they only have on farm what they figure they need for that like you said that burn off and that maybe that first crop uh the first passing crop um probably what's driven this has been mostly the retails. They've been doing a good job of contacting their guys and letting them know where things are at with products and then uh, making sure they get it on farm. And then they're talking to us as well to kind of help us with determining what exactly their, their needs are going to be. If anything, there's maybe been, uh, there's some new products. It's not a new product, but Lotus, uh, will be a new product for us to be using in corn and crop outside of Amazon and tough. And it's, so there's going to be limited supply of it, but you know, so they've been getting the calls out the guys to book that ahead. But other than that, it's been, it's been all right. If any, <laughs> if I have to say that there has been any kind of hoarding, it's probably with Laura's ban when it comes to the insecticide side of things. So, right. but uh, you didn't hear that from me. No. Uh, absolutely not here on the internet where everyone can find it. Uh, Warren says he wish he had he wish he had hoarded old crop soybeans. Don't we all, Warren? Don't ah, we all? Nice. Um, yeah, I do not. I have, I have, I have none. 
I didn't have any to start with. So there you go. Or um, corn for that $10 corn that Peter Johnson yeah, keeps talking about. So yeah, exactly. Um, now, okay. So, so a couple of things that I want to cover when it comes to figuring out what products play nicely together. Are there any resources that you go to or would suggest others to go to? How do you sift through making sure that, especially if if a farmer or as an agronomist, you're going to be using products that you're not maybe as familiar with, um, are there any resources you could direct people to or you would use yourself to sort of sort through avoiding a disaster for some of these, especially for the proven products? Yeah, like this proven agronomist, right? That are like as right. old as those products. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let Ryan start with this one. Um, to be honest, there's not the greatest resource for in terms of compatibility for mixing. Um, other than you know, like you can sort through uh, Tank Mix Partners uh, through Publication Seventy Five. Um, I some of it though is just uh experience so it's having that that discussion with somebody that's been in the industry a while uh that has mixed certain products and knows so having a good relationship with an agronomist or or your retail outlet um they'll often know i actually came across this one not that long ago uh someone wasn't able to source uh hail gt for this coming season already um, surprise, surprise, because Halux GT contains glyphosate, so it will be a, a quick off-the-shelf product uh, in a way to get your glyphosate. So we came up with alternatives and how to come up with Halux. So I was like, okay, well, we could go Acuron glyphosate, which are similar um, chemistry with one addition of bicyclopyrin. Um, then we went through, okay, we could go Prime Extra Prime Extra, Callisto, Glyphosate. And that's where I was like, uh-huh. I remember from like three, four, five years ago, I don't know how long ago, but we we ran into a situation where pl Prime Extra plus Glyphosate does not mix unless you add a non-ion surfactant. And it will turn your sprayer absolutely a mess. Right. The, mm. the only product back then that mixed well with Prime Extra, a glyphosate product at the time, was Touchdown Total. Now we don't have Touchdown Total anymore. Mm. So mixing Prime Extra with glyphosate, you need that non ionic. Um, and this brings me to using websites by the chem company. So yeah. if you go on Syngenta's website and you look at Prime Extra, I'm pretty sure it would state in there if you're mixing it. Uh, this is the mixing instructions and the order for putting products in the tank. Uh, same thing with Halex GT. There'll be an outline of when you put the Halex in, when you put the atrazine in, when you put the non-ionic in. So um, I use uh, chemicals uh, websites quite often. And then obviously the label will, will oftentimes have a lot of that on it as well. So, yeah. Yep, hundred like, percent. Sounds like a lot sorry. of reading. A lot of reading. <laughs> I try to cheat, and so I call people. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, so that you know, Ryan is right. So what I do too, besides those things as well, is we have a really strong relationship with a lot of the technical people within these different companies, and so you you, you utilize them and their expertise. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know the answer, they'll they'll talk to their network, which could be in Eastern Canada, it could be in the U.S. And we utilize, um, you know, North Dakota crop or uh, weed control guide here as well, and talk to their some of the agronomists there and what they're doing to kind of get an idea if we run into those particular situations. So it it really comes back to that network again. Mm -hmm. um, you're someone who likes phone calls. I don't love them, um, but it's it's faster than trying to read everything so there you go um okay so now so patrick has a question any herbicide advice for people who only buy five to a hundred acres worth of herbicide at a time um and usually just before application are they going to be high and dry this year hmm. Maybe. i would say for small acreage 
keep it simple and there are products out there that match up nicely for small acreage there's products out there some people might find it an inconvenience that this jug of chemistry only treats five acres right i don't want to use that where someone the smaller acreage would say that's perfect for me because i can line it up i've got 35 acres of corn i get it in a five acre jug and i'm good to go so hmm. i don't I don't really think though that all those products that say Patrick is looking for on a small acreage is necessarily going to be uh, high and dry. Um, I do f have a bit of a concern for people maybe that just have zero retail loyalty, right? When products are tight, um, the retail level might, you know, kind of save product for people that buy from them year in, year out. I don't know if that's the right strategy for them, but that, that may happen. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. so I don't think acreage or size is, is really, really matters. I think it's more about uh, having a good relationship and, and being prepared early. So just because you're, you're small doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't be prepared and do the things we suggested of having a plan mm -hmm. and contacting your retailer uh, just because you're smaller acreage doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, shouldn't be prepared a month or two ahead. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, <laughs> Gord Spec Snyder says, so the jar test, of course. Um, so Gord says he often jar tests a new mix because he can hear Peter Johnson singing the Jello song in his head. So, and <laughs> Peter does point out, so if anyone doesn't know what the jar test is or can't remember what order, those sorts of things, you can go to Sprayers 101. Uh, and um, Tom Wolf and Jason DeVoe have done a great job putting that together. And there's some great resources there for the jar test um, and trying to avoid exactly that, making a mess of your sprayer and nozzles and booms and all of those things that are a pain in the butt to try and clean out. So absolutely, um, for sure. Great point, Ryan, about the relationships. I think I think that really matters. Uh, Ray DeBanco did mention, Patrick, just uh, get friendly with your neighbors and... Perhaps they'll hmm. just have 50 acres worth of product you can just buy off them. Um, not a bad idea. There you go. It's so relationships, whether it's with your retail or with your neighbor. There you go. It makes it makes a big difference. All right. We are uh, running out of time for tonight. I think I only got one clip in, you guys. I really apologize to Jay, my producer, who I make him queue up three clips and then I don't use them. I really apologize, but this went so well and we were getting so much talking done. I completely forgot. Oh. Um, so, you know, so that's all right. Uh, before we go, before I let you go, um, Jason, you're on a Twitter, of course. What is your handle? Uh, at field to field AG. Oh, there we go. And Ryan, how about you? Uh, at Ryan Benjamins. There we go. There, I like this. It's, and field to field, it's with a two, right? Jason? Yes, correct. Field and to so, field. And I thought I'd uh, showcase the new real egg oh. uh, wardrobe for the agronomists. Oh, so there we go. You, uh, Keep calm you know, and trust your agronomist. Exactly. I love so, it. I so love in case, it. You know. Yeah, just call. Just give your agronomist yeah. a call. It's going to be okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> I like it. So there we go. So here's here's our bottom line. Um, and hop in here, gents, before we go. Um, so call early, call often, work with your egg retail, make sure you got a plan. Make sure you know your weed spectrum, or at least give it give it the best guess you got. Get in there early. And uh, do your research on plan B and C. And tillage doesn't solve everything. There, Peter, that one's for you tillage doesn't solve you know there's always one smart alec who will be like yes okay so weeds can't be resistant to tillage to iron except for that iron doesn't always do a very good job and i've seen dandelion that looks like it's completely uprooted that just starts growing again it just mm -hmm. it's like what big deal and it just yeah. goes to seed and spreads yeah. everywhere anyway so yeah, wild oats yeah. like that too uh-huh yeah, so I get it, but come on now. All right, Jason, Ryan, this has been 
fantastic. Weed bruisers. Warren's calling it a weed bruiser. I love it. Okay. This has been so much fun. I thank you both so much for your time uh, and for your knowledge and your expertise tonight. Thanks for being uh, good sports and joining us here. Uh, thank you to everyone in the comments. And of course, a big thank you to our show sponsor, Adama Canada and uh, Mind Your Farm Business and Real Egg Radio. Uh, we will be back uh, next week. We are going to be talking about uh, crop rotation uh, might, might have to do some plan B, some swapping out, whether that's because of nutrients, uh, herbicide carryover, or shortages of herb of hybrids or varieties. Uh, that's what we're going to do next week. So, Jason and Ryan, thank you so much. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you, everyone who joined us in the comments. All right. Great. Cheers, thank everybody. You. Thank you.